everyone and many thanks for joining the Mike Proctor Foundation series of virtual events in partnership with Cricket Society. Um, I'll just run through a few housekeeping items before we actually kick off. Um, so please make sure you stay on mute throughout the event. The event will be recorded and we will send you out a link to that recording shortly. If you have any questions throughout, if you can use the chat function, which can be found in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen and direct those um, to me. We've already received many questions upon registration, which we will endeavor to answer towards the end of the session. I'll now hand over to Nigel from the Cricket Society. Thank you, Michelle. Um, it's great. I'm Nigel Hancock, the chair of the, the Cricket Society. Uh, I'll say a little bit more that, about that in, in a moment. But the point I really wanted to make was how great it is to have this partnership with the Mike Proctor Foundation and Sounds Like a Plan if, if, if events, which is uh, available both to uh, our members and, and to people in South Africa too. You're two hours ahead of us, I understand there. Um, people say never never meet your heroes. Well, it, it's it's barely noon here and, and uh, my colleague Nick Tudball and I have already met, met Mike Proctor and Barry, Barry Richards, two, two great cricketing icons of, of the last century here in, in, in the UK and, and and, and worldwide. I was looking on the website this morning of the foundation. I, I, I know Longani Zama, who's the moderator and author of Mike's uh, autobiography, and who I'm going to pass to uh, very, 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 very shortly. Um, um, I've been on that website um, already, and there was a nice little piece about training people to run between the wickets. And I thought, wow, there's a few contemporary players who could probably benefit from from that from 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 that training. Um, we, the Cricket Society, had a tour of South Africa the last time England were playing. We're, we're, play, we're playing there, particularly in, in, in Cape Town in January 2020. And um, looking at that site has already made me uh, hope that next time we have a Cricket Society party out there, we can visit um, Ottawa. I shall certainly encourage members to, 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 to do that. Briefly, the Cricket Society is, uh, we're an international organisation, actually. We've got over 100 uh, members outside of the UK, about 1,700 um, in all, we put on quite a few Zoomers in, in as I call them, in, in in the last in the last year or so. We have publications, um, etc. We support cricket in various other uh, ways. So, if anyone's interested in um, um, joining us, have a look at cricketsociety.com at some at, at some point. But what I would say finally, before handing over to Longani to to our members, is is please look at the website. Please consider. Uh, don't donating there it's quite easy you just press a button and you get there I'm certainly going to do it uh, per personally but let's look forward to an interesting hour or so with uh, Mike Proctor and Barry Richard so over to you Langani. Thanks uh, Nigel um, just careful the way you say Zuma because from a South African context uh, that means something completely different given our political structure but anyway um, thanks everyone for for, for joining today um, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure again to, to, to spend some time with uh, two absolute legends of the game in, in Mike and Barry. Um, welcome to the Cricket Society members. Um, thanks for, especially after St. Patrick's Day last night, I'm sure there's a few nursing some, some, some sore heads. Um, but as we said, it's, you know, we look forward to a, a very pleasant discussion with two absolute legends. Um, just in terms of the South African context, I'll just warn you ahead. We've got something called load shedding at the moment. Um, which essentially might seem foreign to you, but it, basically there's power outages around the country at different times. And it's a bit of a lottery. So if some, if one of us disappears, uh, I promise we'll try and get back as soon as possible. We've made contingencies, but we, we, we don't know when these things do happen. Um, my name is Lungani Zama. Um, I've written a, with Mike Proctor, his latest book, um, Caught in the Middle. Um, I won't say too much about it. I, I hope those who haven't bought it yet can go to the, Mike Proctor Foundation website and, and, and purchase it. Um, some fascinating insights, which we won't go too much into in, in this session. We'll, we'll, we'll delve into other parts of his career because he did a heck of a lot over, over the years. And um, yeah, I, without any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Proctor himself to, to give his uh, welcoming uh, statement. Thanks very much, uh, Langani. Um, just at the outset, I'd like to uh, follow up on your words and, and welcome everybody to the show. 
uh, and in particular to, to Nigel and, and Nick, the Cricket Society. And it's just great to uh, join hands with them. And I'm sure we'll have a, a great partnership together. And also, I'd just like to thank all those who've uh, donated money to, to this show. Uh, in fact, uh, it, what it does cover the coaches' uh, fees for the next four to six weeks, which is really, it's really good news for us. So uh, much appreciation from the Mike Proctor Foundation. Lungani? Thanks, Mike. Um... Barry, um, I, I'm sure you'd like to say hello. There's there's a few who followed your career for years, from from over 50 years ago. To to see you with a full head of white hair might surprise those who haven't seen you in a long time. So can you say hello? Yes, am I muted or am I still uh, okay, Langani? <laughs> I hope I've unmuted myself, but uh, it's it's an absolute pleasure. And, and Proxy, uh, you know, he's a, a legend, especially in Gloucestershire. But he's known as uh, it's known as Proxy. So. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get some nice insights into uh, a few battles that we had over the years, and it's an absolute pleasure to be involved. And I hope it's a great success. Thanks, Barry. Um, let's maybe start with um, something a bit a bit current, um, just because we all keep an eye out, obviously on uh, on events around the cricket world going on at the moment. And uh, India and England are currently in a series; they've, 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 they've finished their Test series. I just wanted to find out from the both of you. Um, what have you made about the noise that was um, made about Ahmedabad pitch, especially the, the third test, I think it was? Um, in your day, there was no complaints about pitches. So what do you make of, of all the noise that's generally made about conditions these days when teams tour? I think it's, it's fair enough that uh, the, home, the home country prepares wickets would suit their bowlers. I don't think there's anything too wrong with that. I think that the third test match pitch was maybe a little bit over the top. But I think it just goes to show how well uh, the Indian batsmen played. And uh, not so poorly, the, the, the English batsmen, but I think um, the Indian bowlers bowled brilliantly. And I think Michael Atherton, in, a, in an article in the, in the Telegraph, made a very, very good point. And he was saying that, you know, in the old days, your left pad was your actually your safety valve. You know, when in doubt, you get your left pad as far down the wicket as you can, and the chances are you'll be given not out. Now that left pad has almost been turned to the enemy because you get your left pad down anywhere in line to a straight ball and you're going to be out. So I think the techniques haven't improved over, over the years with, with what's happening on the television screen. Uh, interesting to hear what Barry thinks about it. Yeah, dif difficult pitch, Proc. And, and obviously, uh, I, I mean, I think when you had uncovered pitches in the past, there, were, there was a certain way of playing. I mean, I, you're, you're quite correct with the left pad. I think that, that, that the one thing that the England players did not do, in my opinion, was, was use their feet enough. And, I mean, as a batsman, you try and, wherever possible, it's not easy on a pitch like that, but wherever possible, is to try and dictate the length to the bowlers through your footwork. Uh, you know, there, there's a sweep, there's the defensive shot, and then there's using the feet to try and create different lengths. I don't think I saw much of that in, the, in, in what England did. And it was just a case of, you know, when is it going to happen? When are they going to get out? And, um, you know, I, I think the Indians proved that you, I mean, England spinners didn't bowl particularly well, but the Indians proved that, you know, they scored over 300. So it wasn't as bad a pitch, I think, as they're making it out to be. And the most amazing thing, I think, is that England won the toss the last three test matches. And on a wicket like that, which is going to deteriorate, as we know, a huge advantage to, to bat first. And England were just totally outplayed, having had the advantage. Yep, absolutely. I think that uh, absolutely, and 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 you know, if you'd said to them, "You've won the toss," <clears throat> India would have actually been thinking, "We're on the back foot here," and yet England didn't didn't make them pay a price at all. They they batted so poorly in the first innings. India just said, "Okay, guys, we'll take the reins and off we go." Barry, um, obviously, how you consider batting and using your feet and the way that your hands used to work is is something that not a lot of people can replicate. So it might have been a bit easier for you talking from the outside. Um, mm -hmm. There's a fantastic picture from a few years ago of, of you carrying the bat that you, you used to make 300 in a single day. And you, you've got, in the other hand, you've got David Warner's massive piece of, of oak. Um, I just wondered, I, would, I just wondered your thoughts on how many more runs you, you, you could have made um, <laughs> if, if you were using something that's three times the size of what you used to use back in the day. The funny thing about that, Lungani, is that the weight difference was two ounces. That, that's, that was the one thing that, that surprised me even more than the, 
than the size of the bat. I mean, it's it's sixty. It was sixty three millimeters wide on the edge, and I measured mine, and it was eighteen. And uh, I mean, uh, but you would have thought, you know, this is going to weigh way much more, and it and it doesn't actually. And I I, I just think there's been a lot of R and D and a lot of um, you know movement in the bat, but nothing in the ball. And if you if you're going to make so much of a dramatic improvement in the bat, why not make a dramatic improvement or some improvement at least? and the ball so that you give the bowlers a little bit of hope because the, the ball has not, apart from um, the, the inner sank, you know, the, the cork in the middle, they've, they've run out a little bit of cork. So there's a synthetic cork now, whereas before 1975, there was always proper cork. And, and also the, the, the twine that they use now, they used to get from Ireland, became too expensive. Now from Poland, it doesn't last as long. So you've got a double whammy where the ball is not lasting as long. And they, they, the bats have got just uh, a bit out of control. Barry, I think a lot of bowlers that have suffered at your hands for, for years and years will be quite relieved to hear you have some sympathy for them now that you've finished making all those runs. <laughs> but uh, Ronnie, if I, I can take... The, the Ronnie, yeah, yeah, I just can. say that uh, Barry got that 300 in a day at Perth. I mean, an unbelievable innings. And it contained, I think, Dennis Liddy was bowling, Graham McKenzie, Tony Locke. Um, unbelievable feats. And I remember I, I was communicating with Barry at the time. It, was, it wasn't like social media today. But I remember then he was, he was LBW, I think, if I recall, Barry, LBW man 356. And the first thing you said to me is, said, well, I wasn't out. You, you, were looking, you were looking for a 400, obviously. No, no, no. I, I tell you, Tony Mann, he, he has a more, more appeals than Dr. Bernardo's. And he, he, he just, and the guy actually said to me oh, long afterwards, Carl Townsend was an umpire and he said, listen, Barry, I was just sick of you. That was it. We've had enough. I tried to paddle it down the fine leg because they had everybody on the boundary, <laughs> literally everybody on the boundary. So I tried to just run it off the face, missed it. And of course, no way it was going to be out. But Carl Townsend said, listen, shit, we've had enough of you. Off you go. <laughs> so off I went. <laughs> if, I, if I can take you both a long Long, long way back, Mike. I think you can still remember back this far. But um, when you first went to England and you'd been called over as, as uh, eighteen-year-olds of great promise, obviously had, had started making a name for yourself in South Africa. Um, can you both recall um, just that 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 process of, of going over to England for the first time and different conditions, obviously different weather. Um, I think many South African cricketers of, of, of varying levels of, of skill and expertise have gone over and, and have perhaps had the same sort of trepidation because you just don't know what you're going to find there. What were your thoughts, even as talented as you knew you already were? Uh, we can start with you, Mike. Well, I think, you know, fortunately, Barry and I had both been over 63 of the schoolboy side, but that obviously was a lot different to, to playing in, in the county circuit or playing county second eleven. But it was obviously very, very exciting times. It really was. And, and Gloucestershire looked after us. Uh, they found us digs. We played club cricket as well as secondary different cricket. Uh, and it really was, I think the, the first thing that, that hit home to me, I don't know what Barry thinks, but it was the cold. Uh, it was really, really cold. And I remember them asking, where do you feel? And I said, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a definite, very, very good third man or fine leg. Didn't want the ball coming at me at any, any, great, any great pace. But the conditions obviously a, a lot different, uh, a lot slower. There's not the same much bounce, uh, seam movement, which there wasn't too much in South Africa, but a lot more seam movement in England. A different ball uh, than the Kookaburra. Um, so things were were a lot different. But you know, you know, when you when you've played a couple of weeks and you've you've played a lot of cricket as we had then, um, you, you do become accustomed to the conditions pretty quickly. Barry, you know what, you know what I remember most, Langani. They only used to make the showers hot when the first team played at home. So if we were playing at home and we were the second team, we had the cold showers with the cold weather. <laughs> I remember it well. Uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was not a lot of fun. But we did have fun. I mean, we, we were all about learning. Uh, it was a learning curve for us. I mean, the, the tracks were very different. I mean, the school, on the schoolboys tour, we were pretty much looked after and the school tracks were, were fairly good. But this way around, you know, we had a we had a lot of hard heads and all, you know, guys who are, who played for a living. So you you learned pretty quickly. And I think uh, Mike and I both enjoyed the experience. So we used to play in all the, the games that we could. There were a lot of benefit games. So we, there was a lot of interaction with a lot of good players, which uh, which was always a, a an added bonus for us to to be able to talk to them just to to pick their brains. 
obviously a, a, I remember a, one, a big one a big part a big part mike of uh being over in a different country you experience the culture through the people first of all but also the the food and drink i was uh i was lucky enough in the north i had a, an old english lady who made every english dessert under the sun or pudding as they call it over there i just wondered from from your perspective uh, in bristol and um Barry down south. What were your favorite dishes from those parts of the world? Because you spent you spent a lot of time, so you obviously had a, a lot of meals uh, out and about. Actually, not we, we sort of had a steak, egg, and chips type type situation. But I, I remember Bernie very is. very well. <laughs> I remember very very well the food at at, at Bristol, at the county ground at Bristol, um, was uh, ham, uh, some lettuce, a tomato, and. Uh, Potato, hard, hard, hard boiled potato, and that was it. That was uh, the meal you had at lunchtime or wherever that, or wherever you were, literally around the around the circuit. And I, I look back at that time, and we had a fantastic uh, team spirit within the second team. We won the championship second team that year. Um, and I, I'm looking back, I think Barry Barry um, headed the bowling averages, and I headed the batting averages. But it was the the tremendous camaraderie uh, with all those pros that that we really enjoyed. I mean, there was a guy like Bob Etheridge. He was a wheel keeper and he was a, a journeyman's pro. He played in the second team, played very few games in the first team. He played for Cheltenham Town football in the winter, um, a real journeyman's pro. And it made up of a, a number of people like that, Harold Jarman from, from, who played in, played in Bristol uh, for Bristol Rovers. And we had a, a coach, a guy called Graham Wiltshire, the late Graham Wiltshire, who was a disciplinarian, uh, a real good guy. Uh, a great, a great captain for the second team and a great coach for second team players. Not a coach you would say I would be head coach of a of a major major international side, but he was great for Gloucestershire. Barry, how how did it come that you you ended up going to Hampshire? Because you obviously started at the same place. So who made that call? And 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 were you happy to go a bit further down south where it's a little bit warmer? Not by much, obviously, but a little bit warmer than Bristol, surely. No, no, it was a no-brainer. I mean, you're getting two for one when you got prop, and, and you're only getting one for one with me. So, absolute no-brainer for them. I mean, that, that was a, an automatic choice. Uh, and Sussex were chasing me through through um, I, uh, various people because of the fact that we played on the schoolboys tour and we played uh, for Gloucester too. So there, there was a fair few of people who knew that we were around and about, and that they were changing the rules to allow, to allow a one overseas player. And initially. Uh, I got offered, I think, seven hundred pounds to play for Sussex for for the season. For you know, the guys today wouldn't get out of bed for that. But <laughs> and then Hampshire came along, and you know, I, I didn't know one county from another really. I, I mean, I had no idea about the, the conditions of you know, or who was playing for what. Uh, and they and that they came up with an offer which was uh, a lot better. And, and Clive Lloyd. Uh, originally was going to Hampshire and he'd, he'd almost signed and then Lancashire obviously up their bid for him. So he moved from uh, Hampshire to to, uh, to La Lancashire and I slotted into Hampshire. And now I, I must be honest, I was, I was just happy to get a, you know, to get the opportunity to play because <laughs> at that stage we weren't playing any international cricket. So it was, uh, it was some, somewhere where you, you could ply your trade <laughs> with the best in the world. Mike, uh in a sense, you almost you almost became the original Colpex uh, when you think about it uh, historically. Um, how were you received at, at the time? Because obviously you, you're this young upstart who bowls sort of off the wrong foot and then you, you go and you hammer everyone around the ground and you can catch everything. Um, as a youngster, there must there must obviously be a lot of attention. Um, and, and, and in the county scene, especially the old pros who, who, who've sort of been around for a long time, there's always that sense that they, that they need to to sort of show this youngster the ropes. So how were you received in those first first couple of seasons? I was received very well, Nagani. I mean, I, was, I think I was very fortunate in, in going to Gloucestershire. And we had we had a, a good team. We had a, a solid base, a uh, good team spirit, a lot of camaraderie. And then I was looked after very well. I've, I never found any animosity to, be, uh, to me at all, except for a guy called David Green, who was a very good friend of mine. I became very good friends with him. And he kept insisting that I was taking the taking the money, and I owed them money. And but in a, in a jovial way, I, I was very fortunate to, to be welcomed with open arms. Um, obviously, at that time in 1968, 69, those early years, uh, South Africa to get to England was a, a problem. Uh, flying couldn't fly over Africa because uh, of South Africa's apartheid problems. And there were the odd time 
uh, when you were out and about that uh, you were mentioned to South Africa and that there was, I suppose, a little bit of hostility. I'm not talking about in the cricket sense, but uh, from the outside people at a restaurant or whatever. So uh, almost embarrassingly, you, you say, where are you from? You, you probably say Australia to, to make sure you don't get into, into any, any problems. But, you know, under the situation, uh, I think we were, we were treated fantastically well and no animosity with the cricketers. Uh, they accepted um, who we were and, and, and really welcomed us. Hey, it didn't happen to me, Brock. <laughs> 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 I, had, I had five very old pros and I can always remember my f the first net was indoors. Arrived at April, so the first the first that Roy Marshall, Peter Sainsbury, Derek Shackleton, Butch White, and Bob Cottam, all very old, gnarled pros. So I turned up for the first net, and uh, Roy Marshall said, "Oh, you'll be batting at number four. So oh, okay. So eventually, put your pads on. So off I went. Butch White, first ball sh over the head, duck bouncer. Second ball bouncer. Third ball <laughs> bouncer. Fourth ball bouncer." And I looked at him and he said, you're getting all the money. You get all the runs. <laughs> I said, it's going to be a hard season. It's, it's going to be a tough game. As it turned out, eventually we, we won them over. But it, uh, you know, the old pros weren't all that happy about mm -hmm. overseas players coming in, in, uh, into their domain. But what was um, interesting, one of, the, one of the early games, I think it might have been the first game. And, uh, I, you know, by that stage, they, they'd seen that I was, I was a slip field and I was second or third slip. And a guy went to, to whack it through the onside and, and got a top edge and the ball flew over the, the weird keeper who was Barry Mayer at the time, who became a very good friend of mine. And I started to scream, mine, mine, mine. And I'm off and off to this ball. And as you know, it's coming over your shoulder. And I'm, I look up and I'm looking for the ball. And eventually I dive for the ball and missed it by about four yards. And I just wondered, well, you know, there's this young South African playing in the first team, what they think of his fielding. But uh, unfortunately, it got a bit better off. got a bit better off that. I'll stick with fielding. Uh, we've obviously had a, a great number of questions coming in in the, in the past couple of days, and thank you for that. Um, Barry, the, John Cook says he, as a youngster, used to go down to Southampton, and, and, and uh, on a couple of weekends, he tried to, to go and watch you, and he didn't realise that it was an 11 o'clock start and not 11.30, and the first time you came, you'd, you had already been out, which was a bit of a surprise. And the second time he thought he was going to watch you bat, you, you were unfortunately fielding. And I think the weather was um, predictably miserable and you were standing at slip for most of the day. And, and the only thing that he saw you do was, was take a great catch at slip. Um, and his question was, how do you concentrate for those six hours a day when nothing happens and then suddenly you have to, to, to snap up a, a quick chance like that? Uh, the answer to that is you don't, <laughs> to be totally frank. Sometimes it's so bloody freezing cold that the concentration is on trying to keep yourself warm. And I, you know, my, I think my record, Langani, once was seven sweaters, three backwards, four forwards. And I look like the Michelin man. So, it, you know, it, it can get very cold there. And when Andy Roberts is running up to bowl and they get a nick, it's not the, not the, <laughs> it's not always the nicest thing when you take a catch. But yeah, I mean, slip fielding, I think, is, is, is something that you, you, you it's, it's almost like you're on automatic pilot. You, 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 in between balls, you're just, uh, you know, you, you're, a, there's an awareness. And then when the bowler bowls, there's a deep concentration on what's going to happen. And you watch, you know, the, the, there's guys who watch the ball from the bowler's hand. There's other guys who watch the edge of, edge of the bat. There's no one way of doing it. So, I mean, it's, I think there's, there's a natural, there's a natural in, in terms of uh, being able to, to read the play and see where it's coming and to judge the pace and stuff like that. So, and I think the more you feel that slip, the better you become at doing all those things to, to become a better slip fielder. I think they always thought you just feel that it's slip, it's slip because you, you didn't feel like running around the outfield in the cold. You, you wanted to be close to the wicketkeeper. Well, that's true as well. Absolutely. Mate. My, first, my first game was, you know, Proc talks about his first game. My first game was at Sussex. And, of course, I hadn't signed for them, so they weren't all that happy. And then one of the interviews that I did, and I stupidly, very naive, first, I said I was hoping to get 2,000 runs, you know, and so, you know, that became he's going to get 2,000 runs. So, of course, my first first game, LBW bowled snow zero. And as I'm walking out, all the hard heads are saying only 2,000 to go. So, <laughs> I had a nice introduction there. <laughs> you but should know better than to trust the media. On that, story, that story about that is... Uh, 
I don't know if it's come down the ages and it might have been the next game or the next two within the next two or three games. But the same thing happened again at Yorkshire. Apparently, some of the Yorkshire players, though, those old pros that Barry talks about, we're talking about who's this young upstart coming from South Africa, 19 or 2,000 runs in one season. Well, we can't have that. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I think Hampshire made 190 against Yorkshire and Barry Richards had 155 not out. So that was a good start for his 2,000. Boykes was Mike. playing. <laughs> Boykes was playing. Mike, in terms of your, uh, your action, um, I think it's peculiar to, 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 to say the least. A lot of people struggle to pick it up, especially facing it at, at full tilt. When you went over to, to England, even as a schoolboy, was, was there any coach who tried to pull you aside and correct it in any way and, 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 and sort of you know, give you a more classic action? Lingani, you summed up my action very, very politely. I, th- I think what the coaches did was have a look at my action and say, there's no ways we can coach that. <coughs> Excuse me. So they left me just uh, to, to do what I had to do. And I was never, ever uh, a coach at bowling at all in my life um, because of that, I, I suppose. And because normally when you a bowler, you get side on, you get your left arm up, you look over your left shoulder, but there's no possible way that with my action I could do that. And I think it just progressed from being a wheel keeper to bowling a bit of off spin and then opening the bowling as a, as a school. But I think Barry will, will vouch it when I opened bowling for South African schools. It wasn't a big deal because there weren't many fast bowlers around and I could bat. So I think that's why I did the job. And then when I sort of, my last year at Hilton and then going on after that, I, I grew up, uh, grew bigger, uh, extended my run and just got quicker and quicker. But it was a, a later arrival, the quickness, not the, it wasn't an, an early sort of young tearaway fast bowl at the age of 13 or 14. And I think that Very, helped a lot. I think that helped in many ways because I think a lot of kids try and bowl too fast at too young an age. And that's when the injuries come in. And I think Proc did it the right way around. And he, that he, you know, he only progressed to bowling really quick when he was, you know, quite a mature body. So that, I think that helped in many ways in terms of uh, the injury problems that a lot of kids have. Sure. Um, Barry, from your perspective, um, who, was, who was the most difficult bowler you faced? I know you made it look easy a lot of the time, but who did you not look forward to facing? Was it, was it Procky or, or did you relish the prospect of getting one over your, your lifelong friend? Always, always a good battle. Always a good battle. Proc was never short of a word. Uh, <laughs> he always let you know what he was thinking. It was the, there was never anything uh, about a Proc that you didn't know what was going to happen. I, you know, difficult bowlers, Langani. I mean, if you've got a, a, an uncovered wicket and Proc will vouch for this, and you've got Underwood bowling at, at quite a, you know, a much quicker pace than a normal spinner, or you get Dennis Lilly at, at Perth where, you know, there's tremendous bounce. Or, you know, that, so it's, it's all to do, I think, facing a difficult bowl is all to do with uh, the conditions. If you've got a green track yeah. and it's seeming all around, you know, a guy like Mike Hendrick who didn't, you know, wouldn't do much in... in uh, in Australia or South Africa, but in England where you had a green wicket, I mean, he, he was quite formidable. So I think a lot depended on, you know, what the conditions were as to who, you know, was the most difficult. There's, there's a question to stay with you, Barry. There's a question about the, the 90 that you made in less than an hour. Um, I, I don't know how fondly you remember that. And just maybe to expand on that, which, which were your favourite grounds uh, outside of Southampton to, to, to go to and, and, and where you made runs a lot? I mean, obviously, every kid, if you said, listen, you can only bat once more in your whole life, where would you bat? You'd go to Lords because, you know, that's got so much history to tradition, um, all those, you know, everything that goes with it. But picturesque grounds, uh, Arundel is down in Sussex is a fantastic, Cheltenham, where Proc played is, uh, you know, that's a, a beautiful ground as well. So, you know, there's, there's, there's stadiums and then there's, there's the outer grounds. So, it, I, I guess it's, it's what you what you want to play, you know, I mean, obviously a full house of boards would be number one, but, um, you know, if, you, if you're going somewhere outside of, um, outside of the, the major grounds, then, you know, Arundel or Cheltenham. I see. The, for those who heard that noise in the background, that those are hardy does. Uh, they scared uh, Michelle yesterday, that they are birds. They, they, it's not a baby screaming in the background. Um, <laughs> if we can move on to your to, to, to both your, which was unfortunately very short test careers. Um, Mike, yours was a little bit longer. Um, 
being picked for your country, especially at that time, um, how surprised were you and how quickly it happened? Um, and then obviously the disappointment of how quickly it ended. Yeah, interesting one, Nagani. But just going back to, to your point about I played seven tests and Barry only played four, there's a little bit of, a little bit of history about that. Because, mm -hmm. uh, and Barry can re relate the story as well. Uh, in 66, 67, Barry was obviously still a, a, a prolific scorer then, and everyone could see uh, the fantastic talent. And he was, you know, close to one of the best batsmen in South Africa then. Uh, and he wasn't picked. And if my memory serves me right, and I haven't spoken to Barry about this, but there was a game in East London, uh, a South African 11 against the Australian touring side. Um, and both Barry and I were playing. It was an invitation 11. It was before the, I think before the first or the second test. And um, the, there was a, a, a nightclub at, in East London, and they gave the guys who were playing free entry into the nightclub. Well, I think Barry got a 150 and a, and a 70 in the, in the games, as it turned out. But during the, the, during the match, Barry got to the nightclub late, and apparently uh, they, they didn't let him in. And he wasn't very happy about this. And there was a lovely big uh, uh, vase next to a, a, a pool. Uh, at that this nightclub, and Barry decided to kick this over. Um, anyway, there was <laughs> there was a few problems around, as you can imagine, and a guy called Derek Dowling, who's convener of the the national selection team, and I think was our manager at the time. I, I think I called him, or somebody called him, to try and get it sorted out because we had problems, and eventually it, it was sorted out. Uh, and I believe, and I think a lot of people believe that that's the reason uh, why Barry wasn't selected uh, in those initial years, 66, 67. But I think also it was a it, it was a, it was a huge problem for the selectors because they had a number of, uh, of of senior players who had performed very well. But having said that, Barry was was superior to them at the time. Then, Barry, what are your recollections yeah. about that? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Well, that's what that you you bailed me out, Brock. What are you talking about? <laughs> it hadn't been Dallas no, came racing down. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? The, and and I was I was bear hugged by a uh, by a bouncer my feet weren't even touching the ground and I was plonked into the bloody general manager's office and <laughs> Brock, Brock had a little cadenza and he ran up and thought well what's going to happen because we still got the game going on uh, and I knew actually when you I've got 100 in the first innings and then Trevor Goddard we had five young guys and five senior cricketers at Springboks playing and Trevor Goddard was captain and he came to me and, and he said and I, I started putting my pads on for the second innings and Trevor sidled up to me and he said, uh, Barry, you'll be batting number eight. <laughs> Go look at that. If, if you look at the scorecard, uh, like God, you'll see it. I was 12, not out, <laughs> batting at number eight. <laughs> I, I, knew, mean, the, I, knew when, I knew I knew when I batted number eight, I was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the strength the strength of South African cricket at that time, um, I was lucky enough to spend some time with Eddie Barlow when I played up, up north in, in the UK. But the strength of South African cricket at that time, Mike, is, is sometimes uh, maybe overlooked uh, or taken for granted because of, 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 of everything that happened post-1970. But when you were growing up, who were, your, who were the heroes that you were looking to, to, to try and emulate uh, when you were schoolboys for the both of you? Well, well, my hero was a, a guy from a swashbuckling player from the Natal, uh, Roy McLean. Um, he played, played a lot of cricket for Natal, played for South Africa was once apparently dropped because the selector said he cut too much, playing too many shots. Uh, but he was he was really, really my hero. And uh, I looked to him and, and tried to play or bat the same way as him. But just going back to the Ghanis, when my, my first experience with getting into the South African side, obviously um, there was talk around. Uh, but I'll, I'll never, ever forget where I was. I think I was in, in, in uh, Cape Town at the time. And I heard it on the radio that I was in the 12, which was just unbelievable. You know, I thought I might might have a, a chance of making the side, but not really. Um, and, and I must say, we played a game prior to the, 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 the side being announced. Uh, so that Natal played against Eastern Province, as it was then. And Jackie McGlue was captain of, of the Natal side. And in the second innings, Eastern Province had to go and bat for four or five overs. The wicket was turning. And uh, I obviously wanted to show what I could do. I was just ch champing at the bit to get hold of the ball and come roaring in, particularly as it only be for, you know, two or three overs that evening uh, to try and impress the selectors. And this was the, I think, the Saturday before the, that weekend before the team was announced. And Jackie McGlue threw the ball to uh, Pat Trimborn, uh, who also played for South Africa in 1970. And uh, the second over, he threw it to a guy called Norman Crooks, who was an off-spin bowler. 
Well, I wasn't a happy chappy. I really wasn't. I was grumpy and mumbling. I dropped the catch the third slip, walked off the field, and Jackie, <laughs> to, to his great kid, it came up to me and said, listen, Mike, don't worry. Don't worry about it. You know, I have a reason for not having the bowling with you, but it'll all be sorted out. Almost saying, you know, I think you're in the team anyway. But I wasn't a happy chappy that, uh, that, that Saturday. But a, a wonderful experience, as you say, Lingani, with, with so many, so many talented players. I mean, it really was. And it was a side that we... We, we knew how good we were with, with, without being big-headed about it at all. We just put, went about our business. Uh, we didn't have coaches in those days. We had a manager. And really, we coached, we coached each other. But the one interesting story about coaching each other um, was Bunter. And we know what Eddie Barlow is like. He'd come into the side. And I think Barry was opening with, with Trevor, Trevor Goddard. And Bunter was down to about four or five. And he hadn't seen much of Gleason. And Barry and Graham were the two guys that... that could see Gleason, when you do this with this forefinger, when he does that with that finger, it goes left, it goes right, off break, leg break. And us, us mortals didn't quite understand it, but Barry and Grimes <coughs> had worked it out. And they said this at the team meeting, and Bunter said, yeah, no, he'll sort it out. Oh, no problem, I, I'll read him, boom, boom, boom. Off he goes down the wicket, we're about 140 for two or three. Bunter goes into bat. <clears throat> Who's bowling Gleason? Plays, plays two, three balls from the crease. Obviously, in his mind, he's got it sussed out. He goes down the wicket. But when I say down the wicket, he didn't just take one step. He took two big steps down the wicket to play a booming drive. Well, he missed the ball by about two foot and was stumped by the proverbial mile. But uh, just to say, it, it was a great experience from, from as you say, Langani, a, a very, very, very talented outfit. Barry, um, Mike's touched on Graham Pollock um, and then many other greats of that era. Um Obviously, playing just before test matches was extremely sad for, for, for world cricket to, um, not to see you at the ultimate stage. Over the years, when you looked at that team and, and, and the teams that followed in the 70s around the world that were playing test cricket and competing against each other, um, I know you've been asked this a, a hell of a lot of times, but how, how, how dominant do you think that South African team or how would they have competed against those great teams of the 70s and 80s? I think apart from the West Indies side, I mean, the West Indies side that, that came in the late 70s was a, was a hell of a side when Viv, Viv was in his pomp and there was Gordon Greenwich and then the four fast bowlers who, you know, they, they were so mean they only breathed in. Um, and they were very, very difficult to, to face. So, I mean, when you've got a barrage of, uh, you know, one guy bowls seven, one guy bowls six, and that's your 13 overs for the hour. And then the next two come on and they do exactly the same thing. And then the first two have had an hour's rest plus lunch. And they, they bombard you all day. It's very, very difficult. So, I mean, that would have been a real challenge for us, a uh, real challenge indeed. I suppose. I think, Mungani, the, the interesting one here would be, okay, the 1970 side, that, that's when we, we stopped playing international cricket. But the, after 1970, 1971, 72, that sort of era, early 70s, um, I think that had a chance of even surpassing the 1970 side because – Suddenly, Vince van der Baal was in, in contention. A young Clive Rice came into contention. We had a guy called Dennis Hobson, a leg spin bowler, uh, and a top, top quality leg spin bowler. You know, he came into, he came into the act. Uh, so, you know, we got to 1970, 1970, and, and beyond would have been would have been an unbelievable side. I don't know what Barry thinks about that, but I think maybe... Uh, I, think, maybe I think 72 could have been a better side, to be honest. Good. Okay. Or well, more's the pity, obviously, for the game that that, that we didn't see that team uh, play against the the absolute pinnacle of the sport. But you 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 both um, did fantastically in, in the World Series. Um, would you both agree that that was probably the toughest cricket that you played? Yeah, I, I think th there's no doubt it was it was really tough. Uh, and I think the reason for that was, as we know, World Series cricket was was uh, Kerry Packer, and uh, it started when he wanted the television rights. Uh, to cover England, Australia, the Ashes. And uh, he was turned down by the Australian Cricket Board. And the, the, the money involved was a lot less than Kerry Packer had offered. So he wasn't, he wasn't very happy. There was a lot of um, un, un, unhappiness within the, within the cricketers. They, the, the money and the remuneration received was, was very poor, particularly in Australia. I think there was a, a classical game where uh, the centenary test match, and they had what, hundreds of thousands of people at Melbourne. And the, the, the Australians got three or four hundred dollars for the whole whole game. Anyway, everything was right. So Packer decided to to sign up the, the top fifty five players in the world. And why I say it, it was the most tough because uh, we were taking on the world. 
we were ostracized totally from world cricket. We didn't run, fall under the auspices of anything. If we had, a, had to have a practice, we had to hire a, a club ground or a school ground. Anything to do Australian cricket was an absolute no-no. So we had to prove uh, in play that, that we were the best. So we had to produce our, our, our best results on the, on the field. And I think if you look at the records, I think the, 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 bowlers, the bowlers certainly dominated uh, to a great extent. They really did. Uh, but to me, the, the, the highlight, and uh, Barry and I could talk about it for 10 minutes, is, was that the final, the final World Series cricket match ever played, which was the world team uh, against Australia at Sydney. And Barry got 100 in the game. And I was fortunate to, to come in with, uh, I think we were about 80 for four, needing 230, 240 on a bit of an up and down Sydney pitch. Uh, and the Australians champing at the bit because they'd just been thrashed in the one day final. So they weren't happy. Uh, and um, I managed to put on quite a lot of runs with Barry. I got 40 odd, 45, I think I was out. And, and, we, and we won the game. But Barry played superbly, getting, getting 100. And, you know, the, the Australians, I think Barry will relate the, the story of, of how, how he, he, he couldn't hit the winning runs, um, for what Ian Chappell did. But it was really exciting times for us. And as, uh, as you asked the question, the hardest and toughest, absolutely no doubt. Uh, but the beauty of it was on the field was really, really tough. Nothing given, nothing gained, nothing. But off the field, the camaraderie was fantastic. It really was. And I think that summed up the whole thing. There was just a tremendous com camaraderie from, from one and all. And the funny thing is that Afghanistan versus Zimbabwe is test cricket. And that is not even first class cricket. I can't believe it. It's, but there we are. Harry, do you remember that? Uh, you obviously do. That last ball you received yeah. before the last ball ever bowled in World Series cricket. <laughs> yeah. Ian, Ch Ian Chappell took the ball. There was one run to get. I was about to face. And Rod Marsh, I think, sussed it out that something was going because Chappell never bowled. And he, he took the ball. Uh, he, he, he had, what, what gave him the absolute, um, you know, the, the, he was, was absolutely angry, was seething. A, because they're going to lose, but B, because Greggy didn't come into bat. He sent Imran into bat off the prop. And uh, Ian Chappell just wanted, he wanted to get Tony Gregg. And Greggy didn't come in. So there was one run to go. Greggy obviously wasn't going to bat. He came on and he bowled it. And the square leg umpire mm -hmm. had to jump out the way. So it was one wide, game lost. And off we <laughs> walked. And uh, it, <laughs> it wasn't a great ending. And uh, Rod Marsh, to his credit, said, listen, that's not a good way to end the game. Chappell didn't say a word. He, he wouldn't even shake hands with Greggy. He was so grumpy. Yeah, I remember that presentation, Barry, when you say Chappelle didn't shake hands with Greggy. I was sort of in the middle of the queue next to Garth, um, and then Greggy was on my right. And if you recall, the Australians took a long time to come out of their dressing room. They were very grumpy about having lost this money and the big bucks. And eventually they came out and shook hands. And I, I was next to Tony Gregg, and he, Chappelle sort of shook hands with me and said, well, well, well played, Proc. And he put out his hand and suddenly realized a very tall guy. And he looked up at Greggy. And he said, nice contribution from you. And went to the next guy. And he carried on, obviously, a few swear words. But uh, that, that was the reaction. And I think, to me, that was just a little sad part about the World Series was the confrontation a little bit between Tony Gregg and Ian Chappell. Because uh, at the end of that match, uh, we were at our dressing room. We were very happy chappies. And to their credit, uh, Dennis Lilly, Rodney Marsh, all the guys came through. And eventually, Ian Chappell had had his press conference. Uh, eventually, he came through. And at this stage, Greg is now on the table in, in the first part of the, the visitors' dressing room, and he's uh, he's he's giving his, his spill uh, to all the, all the reporters. And and Chappelle, you know, knocked on the door to come in, and and Greg told him to f off. So um, from that point of view, it, it wasn't great, but it was. That's why I say, as you, Ghani, you did ask the question. It was tough. Yeah, Barry. Um, obviously, the the reason that your short your your test career was so short, short was was political. Um. <laughs> In terms of uh, what became almost the face of, 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 of the major political issues, Basil de Oliveira, how sorry did you feel for him that he got stuck in the middle? And, and then obviously just, just your personal sadness at, at, at just four test matches when you could have played 100 and, and goodness knows what numbers you could have put up. I mean, disappointment, uh, Langani, more than any, and disappointment for Basil. I mean, Basil is a tremendous cricketer. I mean, he, he, he proved he was a tremendous cricketer. For, but, but, I mean, life throws curveballs at you all the time. A loss of a son, loss of a relative, 
I think puts everything in perspective. I mean, to, to not play a few test matches is a disappointment. To lose a son is a tragedy. To lose a partner is a tragedy. So um, these things happen in your life and you, and you can't change it. You know, you'd like to, you can't. And the fact that you only played four test matches, it's probably when I think I'm, I'm probably lucky. I played four. Vince van der Beyl didn't play any. And he was a tremendous cricketer. So you, you've got to always look on the positive side. You, you can beat yourself up about the fact that you only played four tests and Gordon Greenwich, you, you opened with them many occasions, played with and played 100. Uh, I mean, if you put it in perspective of life, it's, uh, it's, it's a disappointment. It's not a tragedy. In that context, um, the, the kind of work that, that Mike and, and, and others are doing around the country to try and make cricket uh, so much more accessible to communities that just previously didn't have it in South Africa, how important is that um, in, t- in terms of unifying South Africa firstly and, and also perhaps cultivating more of that cricket culture to give us more options to, to get back to the heights that you know the teams that, that you played in could have reached? What is- Langani, it's more important than Proc and I ever contributed onto the field. It's much more important. It's, it is, from a South African perspective, to be able to give access to this game to all these people, our, our contribution on the field pales into insignificance. What Proc is doing is something, you know, I've made a small contribution as a, a young kid that I put through school here in Naisna, and he is a much better person. I cannot believe when I met him after he passed his matric from the time that I met him when he was in standard seven, it is a totally different kid. He is so much more confident. He's so much more of a contributor to, to society. And this is what I'm sure uh, it will give Proc much more satisfaction that Ottawa goes from strength to strength from any, you know, any hundreds or hat tricks or whatever he did on the field, which was a fantastic achievement. But if this is a great success, which it ought to be, it will give him more satisfaction. Yeah, I think um, those are firstly fantastic words and, and great sentiments. And I think maybe it puts in perspective for members of the Cricket Society and people in the UK maybe who don't understand the full dynamics of, and the challenges that South Africa still has to this day. Um, and I've, I've spent some time with Mike at Ottawa and I think... I've never seen a bigger smile on his face celebrating any wicket or any hundred as compared to when those kids come out at break time and there's a hundred kids rushing to him all wanting to, to get the ball out of his hands. So I think those those stories and, and, and those efforts that he's made and, and I think he can maybe expand on some of or some of the work that he's done even during this current pandemic where it's moved away from sport and became a case of uh, survival. Mike? Yeah, thanks, Lugani, and thanks for those words, Barry. It is... Uh, very satisfying, I must say. And um, as we know, with the pandemic and, and, and how it affected how it affected everyone around the world, and none more so than people in South Africa, because uh, the South African government were, were very strict, uh, and rightly so. I think it's been proved correct. There were there were people criticising, as they as they are in, in every country, criticising their government. But I think what South Africa did was the right thing in the end. But a lot of people had to suffer, and as we know, the poorer communities in situations like this do suffer. And uh, I, I was very fortunate to get involved, ambassador for Hollywood Bets, and they came on board and, and we decided uh, to, to have food parcel drop-offs uh, for the community around Ottawa. And it really was a, a fantastic experience, as Barry and you have said, that, that I get so much joy out of that. And the joy I got out of the food drops was, you know, first of all, the, the efficiency from, from Dev and the Hollywood Bets was, you know, okay, guys, seven o'clock in the morning, we're, we're at spa. Um, we leave Spa at quarter to eight, having got all the food onto the trucks. Quarter to eight, we, we arrive at Ottawa, quarter past eight. Uh, quarter past eight to half past ten, we put all the food into bags. Uh, from 11 o'clock to half past one, the community comes through. Everyone's registered. Uh, Ms. Bassani at Ottawa Primary knew all the families involved. And the first food drop was, was 300, 300 food drops. Uh, we did a, another one about three or four weeks later for 150. And just to put in some perspective, uh, 450 food drops, uh, and it came to just under, can you believe, six tons of food, six and a half, six and a half kgs each bag, which is 13 for one bag, uh, times 450, just under six tons. And, you know, that gave, gave I think, but everyone involved, the Hollywood Bed staff, uh, the Ottawa staff, the guys we had, probably 25, 30 people getting all this stuff together. And, and it was just, 
it, it was just a feel good situation. You know, there was rubbish around. It was ever it was ever near there, picked it up, put it away, and everything just got done with a smile on our faces. We knew we were we were helping people, and we wanted to do it. And it was just a sort of the inner inner camaraderie of, of that that small small group of people three or four hours was was really rewarding. And then just seeing the seeing all all the the people come through and getting their food parcels and and you know showing their delight and, and being so thankful. And uh, to me, that was. Uh, was fantastic exercise. It really was. And obviously, Mike, all the uh, a significant chunk of the donations that that come to the foundation make those efforts possible. And even when those kids can go back to playing cricket, that's exactly what it feeds into. It 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 allows those those communities who I think it's three or four schools who share one one sports field that it allows them that opportunity to go outside and and, and play the game. And as you've said often, maybe one of those kids one day starts running out for South Africa. I think there was a girl, the ones that you showed me was tall and had this magnificent action. And you said you, you're trying to get her into, into a program to, to perhaps give her a chance at, at making sport a, a career. So it's, it's, it is great work. We, we've got 10 minutes left. So we're going to try and wade into this long list of, of questions that we've got here. And I think it's, it's important that we start with a guy called John Taylor. I don't know if you remember the name, Mike, but he, he used to be head groundsman at uh, Gloucester and then also at the Cheltenham festivals. And uh, he just wanted to know what was your most memorable match at both those, those pitches, because obviously he prepared them. So he, he, he's personally invested. Yeah. Gloucester, the way, the wagon, wagon, weeks, wagon, wagon grounds was called. Cool. Wagon, yeah. wagon works. Yeah. It, it, it turned a lot then. In fact, one of the best balls I faced in my life, talk about the wagon works was against Middlesex. Uh, must have been late 60s, uh, early 70s. And I went to bat about 100 for two. And Fred Titmus was bowling. And Fred Titmus was a beautiful horseman. He had a beautiful flight. And he ran up to me and bowled the first ball. And it, was, it started about middle, middle, middle and off. Drifted slightly away. So it was going to pitch around outside outside the off stump. But it was a, a long half volley. And I was, obviously you look to defend when you first come in. But my eyes lit up. This was going to go through the covers for four. Well, I went to drive the ball, and it, it, it dipped in the air away, pitched just outside off stump, went through the gate, and uh, hit the top of off stump. Procked the ball, first ball not. But it, the Gloucester ground was was fabulous. Uh, the Cheltenham ground, you know, even better. I think the surrounds of Cheltenham uh, with the chapel there and the, the stands. And as Barry mentioned, one of the best most cricket school grounds uh, in in the, in the world. It really is a, a great place to play. The wicket conducive to uh, pace. More than more than spin, but I don't know whether Bradley will remember. But I remember we talk about Dolivera. We we in, in 1965 went to Cheltenham to watch Gloucester play Worcester. It was the third the third day. The wicket turned square. In fact, uh, David Smith, the seam bowler, bowled the first ball. He was an opening bowler, and David Allen, the off spinner, bowled the second over to Worcester, who needed about 175 in the second innings. They were 10 for three. Tom Graveney came, was in and Basil D'Oliveira were together. They played the, the, these, the spinners unbelievably well. They really did. The, the, the wicket turned square. It really did a bit, a bit like almost what happened in India. And these two manipulated it and they won by seven wickets. So I don't know whether you remember that, Barry, but to me, it was an absolute masterclass in playing spin. Absolutely. I, would, I remember watching that. Tom Graveney was just outstanding and Basil played uh, one of the best knocks he'll ever play. Barry, um, I promise this is not my question. This is John Heckles, I think appropriately named. He brings up uh, a magnificent spell of bowling by Procky of all people uh, when he took four wickets and five balls and finished with six for 13 and you were one of the, the four and five. Um, and he just wants to know, was that the best bowling? Well, it was only one ball, but maybe if you could expand on the best bowling you have ever faced. Well, Proc, I don't know why, for, for some reason that day, Proc went round the wicket and it swung like you can't believe it. Really? And it, 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 just, it just, and I, I, the funny thing is that he got four in five balls, but the, 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 the one that was the most out was Nigel Cowley. And <laughs> I, think, I think it was Tommy Spencer. He said, Proc, I can't give another LB. He said, it's out, but I can't give it out. <laughs> And, and, and Dougal, Dougal was the plumbest of them all. But going back to what Barry said there, what, what was interesting about that, I remember it so well. I bowled over the wicket. 
And I'm now bowling to, to Greenwich and Richards. I mean, arguably the two best opening bats in, in world cricket. And the, over the wicket, obviously the ball should swing more because of the angle than around the wicket. But I bowled two or three overs. I think Hampshire were about 18, 19 for naught. The deck was pl- flat. And I'm looking at it. I was just trying just try anything. We've got to get a breakthrough here because we just definitely haven't got enough runs. And I went around the wicket. And for some reason, as Barry said, the ball swung. And all I did was pitch up every single delivery. And the, the ball swung. And they were either bold or, or LBW. But... To me, and I did you have did you did you have did you have did you have the little the, the sweets in your mouth, bro? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't use anything to make the ball swing. <laughs> Unfortunately, but to me, one of the most the, the most important over I bowled in that game. Uh, Barry probably doesn't remember, but Hampshire still needed nine to win, and they were eight wickets down. We still had to get two wickets, and there were nine. I think it was about nine that they needed to win, and I decided that the penultimate over was going to be the, the toughest over. Um, so I decided to bowl the penul- penultimate over and I got a maiden wicket and Brian Brain bowled the last over and Andy Roberts, I think, had slogged a four uh, and then was, was bowled next ball. But that that last over I bowled in that match was as important as that where I go when I got four and five. There's time for just one more question for the both of you. Otherwise, the Zoomers really will shut us down. Um, for <laughs> for the you, country, uh, Barry, country down, Slingoni. The Zoomers. He might just. Barry, <laughs> you never know, <laughs> Barry. Um, for, for, from your perspective, um, I think a, a lot of people know that you was highly competitive. These days, um, when you watch the game, who who's the player that you would pay money to 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 go and watch it in, in the modern game? I think you could probably. Uh, I could count on two. Uh, one is A.B. de Villiers. If he played any time that A.B. plays, I'll, I'd definitely like to watch. Uh, and Coley. I think Coley's got a, you know, he's a, he's a tremendous performer and uh, he's the kind of guy that can manufacture shots. And that's what I like. I mean, he, 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 he always tries to take the game away from the opposition. And that's something that I enjoy. Brilliant. And I, Mike, I, agree I, mean, with, I, I agree with Barry on those two. But there's one guy. One guy, if I had to choose in a situation, any situation, particularly if it's a tough situation, I'd go that the Indian wicketkeeper, Fant. I have never seen a guy that Anderson runs up and bowled. Was it Anderson? Second it new Anderson, ball. Yeah, it was. He's got 90 and he plays, he plays a reverse sweep from a good length ball over the keeper, one bounce four. I mean, this is test cricket for goodness sake. You know, he, he, he's just absolutely fearless. And then, and then he's, he's on 95. He's just down the wicket and swats it over mid-wicket for six. I mean, you just don't do that. He, he, to me, unbelievable cricketer. Mike, your, your question, I think because this is a series and there's going to be another one of these at the end of the month, uh, we'll save some ammunition for that. But Craig Pickering had a great question for the both of you, which was asking, do you think the game was more interesting back in the day? Um, and has modernization perhaps um, taken taken a lot out of the context. Maybe, I suppose, what, what he's asking is, do you think there were more characters in the game back back then? Obviously, there was no social media, so some of the shenanigans that you got up to didn't make the front pages of the mirror the next morning. Um, but do you think the game was more interesting back then? It's been sanitised a lot, obviously, because of social media. And when I, I mean, I, I one of the things that does dis- disappoint me a little bit from on the field point of view, uh, Lingani, is I don't think it's a fair enough contest between bat and ball, but that's only a personal opinion and I think a lot of people like to see four and sixes it's RPL all the way these days so perhaps that's the way it's going but I, I would like to see a fairer contest uh, because you know I just like to see a contest yeah I, I agree with I agree with Barry totally I, I, I think in, in a way it's, it's actually even more interesting now I think the one thing which has uh, proved beyond doubt uh, changed unbelievable as a fielding. The standard of fielding is, is extraordinary. It really is athleticism of the fielders, the catches they take. But I must say the, the catches when uh, the guy t- taps the ball back and he's over the boundary, jumps back on and catches it again. In, in the good old days, you wouldn't be able to do that because you played right to the to the end. You right, played right to the to the picket fence. Um, so I, I think the it has got even more interesting because of the, because of the fielding. And, and I, I think the referrals for the third umpire is actually made it interesting as well. I think it just uh, slows things down a bit, creates a, 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 another spectacle. And if, overall, uh, it hasn't got the characters it had in the old days for obvious reasons. But I think uh, overall, it's more interesting now than then. 
Okay, I'll I'll unfortunately have to stop there for today because we could have gone on to the rest of the world match against England and your six centuries in a row and Barry's golf where he's still breaking his age. Um, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot we could still discuss, but we can save that for the next in this series. Um, I'd just like to thank yeah. both of you, obviously, two fantastic legends of the game for giving us your time. We could sit and listen to you all day. And also the, the members of the Cricket Society who've, who've taken their time. I see England and India are just about to take the field, so our timing is perfect. Um, and I'll hand over to Mike to to to, to give the uh, the final thanks. No, thanks very much. And Lagani, thanks to you. And, and I mean, obviously, thanks to Barry, who's, who's always always been a, been a master as far as, as helping out. And, and as he said, he, he helped a, a kid in Nisner, which gave him a lot of satisfaction, which is, which is really fantastic. And to, to all of you out there, uh, for for uh, helping the Mike Fox Foundation. And for those that have donated money, I can just tell you now that, uh, as I said at the start, it's, it's paid for, so far paid for four to six weeks of the, the coaches' uh, salaries. And we have just got a new coach, Beverly, who, who joined us last Tuesday, which is, as I said, very exciting. But we have got exciting things coming up as far as our 50th anniversary is concerned. One is uh, the 1971 walk-off in Cape Town. Uh, and also the 1971 semi-final that Gloucestershire played Lancashire in the infamous uh, night game when the BBC News carried on after nine o'clock to see the end of that match. So there, there is a lot coming up, but to, to you all, uh, a very sincere thank you. It's for, for a fantastic cause uh, and may we see you again very, very shortly. So thanks very much. And to Nigel and the Cricket Society, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Mike and Barry and, and, and Langani. I mean, the last hour or so has just gone by in a in a flash, and isn't it wonderful that we're going to have a, a at least at least one follow up? Um, we've heard some great stories already, and I'm sure there are a lot more to come. And um, we've also heard um, con context too. What did they know of cricket who only cricket know? We've heard quite a bit about the foundation, the wider context in in South Africa, and it will be good to experience more more of, of, of that in the weeks in the weeks to come so thank you very much on behalf of the cricket society for, um, for reminding us today of, of, of so much that happened over here and in world cricket and still happens um, today and to close I'll pass to Roger Cooper who's the trustee of the Mike, Mike Proctor Foundation okay thank you Nigel and uh, thanks uh, to Mike and Barry and Langani for a absolutely riveting hour uh, and thank you to everybody for their question, for the questions that you've submitted. We haven't got through all of them, but as um, I think it was Langani said, um, there's, a, there's another one coming up, uh, probably at the end of April. We don't have a date for it yet, but we will let people know. Um, so it's something to look forward to. And we'll focus more then on the second half of, uh, of Mike's uh, career, uh, all the successes that Gloucestershire had in the 1970s. Um, when it became known as Proctorshire, which I know embarrasses him, but there, there we are. Um, and last, thanks to everybody who has tuned in and for your generous donations, as Mike has said. And so, um, and also thanks, of course, to the Cricket so Society for co-hosting and to Michelle and her team at Sounds Like a Plan Events, without whom we would not have been able to, to put on this show. So hopefully see you all at the end of April. Um, but for now, enjoy the T20 match, which is just about to start. And above all, stay safe. Thank you very much. I have the, the Mike Proctor Foundation and the foundation was really formed, I formed it to, to help schools like Ottawa. And if we can achieve that at Ottawa, you know, we could achieve it at a lot of other schools. We want to go very big, and through the foundation, uh, I want to create the Ottawa Project uh, in as many places as we possibly can. I was very fortunate to, to play for South Africa. As an international sportsman, especially living in South Africa, I had a, a privileged upbringing. And it's also one of my dreams is to, to bring the local cricketers, like the Dolphins as they are know, known now, to bring them to Ottawa and let them come and do some coaching for, for a couple of hours, maybe once a week or once a month, just to show them how the other side lived, how hard it is for these kids to actually learn to play cricket. And I had the opportunity to coach at Ottawa through a friend of mine, Rodney Malamba. Yes, it has made an impact, but they never knew cricket, they never played cricket before. But from that 
positive response and the way it sort of hooked on the teachers as well, it ended up becoming a major sporting program for the school. And it's a very, very poor school. They've got, uh, they've got no facilities. 90% uh, of the children are HIV orphans. So when they go home, they go home to uncles or aunts, grandparents, and uh, there's not much of a home life. They have one meal a day on average, and that's the meal that the school supplies at around 10 o'clock in the morning. Some of them obviously have more than one meal, but on the average they only have that one meal a day. And I looked at cricket as a way of helping them to, to be a bit more freer, to, to enjoy life. And there's nothing I enjoy more than, than going to the school and, and seeing those kids smile and just looking happy. And to me, that, that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm using cricket uh, to try and better their lives, to give them a bit of freedom, to teach them a few more life skills, team spirit, confidence in themselves. Most of the kids, or all of them, um, before we went there, have never picked up a bat or a ball in their life. They didn't know much about cricket. And um, just the, the, the joy they get out of holding a ball, running up or standing and throwing it or trying to bowl it and having a bat in their hands, they sort of at the centre of, of attention and uh, they really, really enjoy it. Most definitely we've got a young lady across there, she's very clued up and she, she, she runs around and gives you the kind of feeling that there is a cricket brain there and hopefully we will work with her up until she reaches her dreams. Our great leader, uh, Nelson Mandela, he had uh, some magnificent quotes and I use him quite a lot. And the one thing he said was, sport has the power to change the world. He also said we owe our children, the most vulnerable citizens in any society, a life free from violence and fear. And I want to do this with the kids. I want to, to have them free from, from violence and fear and, and, and enjoy themselves. We obviously, 840 kids is impossible. Um, we're trying to get other uh, coaches involved, we're trying to get other people involved. But funds are obviously very, very, very limited. But my dream, and Rodney's dream, is if we can make Ottawa the flagship, we can get everything right at Ottawa. It's a fantastic school, the principal's fantastic, the kids seem happy, there's discipline, it's clean. And if we can make this the flagship, if you can do it on, at one school, we can do it at two schools, and two becomes four. We just hope but I can send a message out there that we need all the help we can get. Uh, I'm very excited about it and I'm excited for the kids because they seem to just enjoy themselves. I would like to thank the Mark Tractor Foundation for the kind of help that they've been offering to us. Uh, there were times when the department would not be able to feed us, uh, uh, especially during the months of January and, and, and December. But the Mark Foundation were able to supply us with food and the children and we're able to eat during uh, those times. Not only that, as I've mentioned before, Mark has been very instrumental in training uh, uh, boys uh, in cricket, and some of them were not in a position because they did not even see a cricket ball before. But if you can see them now, they are very willing and they are very able and they are very able. I mean to play cricket and that, but we hope that uh, Mark will continue doing the good work that he's doing for the school. Yeah.